Hi guys, I'm EVM and welcome back. Now, this car is about to trip over to 50,000 miles. It's my second EV. And it kind of got me thinking, I wonder how much I've spent on fuel, electricity in this case. So I thought, you know, this is a good time to do a comparison. How much would 100,000 miles cost to do in your typical electric vehicle versus a typical petrol or diesel car? Now, of course, there are many variables in all of this. So I'm going to try and look at several usage patterns, including those that can charge at home and those that can't charge at home. So, how much do you think 100,000 miles in petrol or electric alone would it cost for you to do? If you're unfamiliar with electric cars, I think you're going to be uh, in for a little bit of a surprise. Right, so how are we going to figure this in out? Well, basically, I'm going to use three usage patterns for an electric vehicle. Those that can charge at home and are on the best tariff for an EV driver. Therefore, you can charge at night, for example, when it's cheap. Uh, we're also going to look at those that are just on a standard UK average tariff at home and see how much it would cost for them. And then look at how much it would cost for people who can only charge using the public charging network, those that cannot charge at home, because obviously there's a significant amount of people who will be in that boat. Like petrol cars, EVs come in efficient and inefficient models, so I'm gonna have two comparisons for that, one that does three miles per kilowatt hour and one that does four miles per kilowatt hour. For the combustion engine, we'll be comparing 40, 50, and 60 miles per gallon cars. Remember, that's over the entire 100,000 miles, not what you get on an efficient long motorway journey the entire life, I suppose, of the car. Now, as far as the electric vehicle comparison goes, it's 100,000 miles divided by three, if the car does three miles per kilowatt hour. So, 100 divided by three is 33,333. That means that that car, over 100K, will have used 33,333 kilowatt hours of energy. If the car did four miles per kilowatt hour, then of course it would have used 25,000 kilowatt hours of energy over the 100,000 miles. So that gives us how much fuel we've used in the EV. Then we just times that by whatever you pay per kilowatt hour on your electricity tariff, whether it's at home or on a public charger. So the nighttime tariff, the one that I am on, I only pay five pence per kilowatt hour. So that means I tell my car to use its built-in timer. So even if I plug it in during the day, it only charges at night when it's cheap. That saves me an absolute fortune. So for that, it will be five times 33,333. If you're just on a standard UK tariff, I have used 15.75 pence for this. That is from the uh, Energy Saving Trust and their figures are from March 2019. That apparently is the UK average for the pence per kilowatt hour on an electricity tariff. Now for public charging, I've decided that's going to be an average of 25 pence kilowatt hour that for me is massively weighted against an EV so the figures are pro petrol engine if you like because I don't want anyone to think I'm being biased towards the uh, the electric car in reality even though a lot of rapid charge networks charge 30 pence per kilowatt hour or maybe even some slightly more than that the majority of public charging that most people would end up doing would be on a fast charger which is substantially cheaper if you have a Polar subscription, for example, it's free. So, you know, a lot of supermarkets have free chargers. So ultimately, if you had to rely on the public charging network, 25 pence per kilowatt hour is, is probably the worst case scenario. No one is going to be using rapid charging and nothing but. Well, the law, there's always one and no doubt it'll be in the comment section. But ultimately, that is definitely weighted against EVs. Now, if you're wondering where I got a five pence per kilowatt hour electricity tariff from, I will put in the description below a link to a video where I basically show you, with facts and figures like this one, very exciting video, uh, who is currently the cheapest electricity provider for an electricity car. Electricity car? An EV <laughs> Now, of course, I hear you all, hang on a minute, if you're just gonna time five pence per kilowatt hour times 33,333, who on earth is going to be able to do 100,000 miles in an EV and do nothing 
but charge at night time. That's a ridiculous thing to do. And you're right, but this is about averages and I'm still going to use these figures. However, I am going to use my real world experience as well as speaking to many other people. So there'll be a fourth figure in all this, a real world example. Right, now let's have a look at the figures, how I've worked them out and how much it costs you to run an EV over 100,000 miles. In fact, no, first I'm going to get something to eat and then do it. Oh, right, that was a nice tasty lunch and I don't think anybody has noticed that it's taken me two days to have it. Where was I? The, uh, the figures for an EV driver given the three different usage profiles. I'll put them all up now uh, and I'll start with the three miles per kilowatt hour one. So here they are and as you can see the home charger, if you can charge at night on the best tariff, ends up costing you £1,667. Uh, if you charge at home but just uh, on a standard UK average tariff it's going to cost you £5,250. So if you ever want to see a perfect example of why you should concentrate on what electricity tariff you're on, even if you don't have an EV, but in this case, if you if you have an EV as well, look at the difference it can make. Public charging, of course, that's much more expensive, 8,333. Uh, but like petrol cars, EVs come in all shapes and sizes. Some are efficient, some aren't efficient. Uh, so if we do the four miles per kilowatt hour, home charging is 1,250. Average UK price at home is 3938 and public charging is 6250 So you can see there the benefits of driving more efficiently, I guess, and the savings over 100,000 miles. Now, I should point out once again that the prices, especially for public charging, are kind of worst-case scenario. This is the most you should end up paying. Now, before I go on to the petrol and combustion engine side of the comparison, uh, the real-world example I mentioned about the EV. For this, I have basically split the usage pattern up between all three. 85% of your charging will be done at night. In reality, for me, that's probably at least 90, because you just plug the car in and the timer takes care of it all. Uh, about 5% of the mileage will be done kind of during the day when it's more expensive, and I reckon about 10% of the miles I do, over 100,000 miles, will be done using the public charging network. So if you take all those three percentages, do all the figures, we end up with £2,511. Again, that's the worst case scenario. In reality for me, probably 2223 So we're looking at £2,500 for 100,000 miles of real world EV usage. That is also based on three miles per kilowatt hour. In reality, again, I'll probably get closer to four, probably even more than four. Now onto the combustion engine. I've chosen 40, 50 and 60 miles per gallon. And for that, I've basically taken the price from the RAC's daily average price website, which basically tells you what the price of fuel is on any given day across the UK. For this, it's £1.27.74 pence per litre. That's petrol, so I've chosen the cheaper petrol rather than more expensive diesel. And to figure out the fuel economy, I've used a website called Fuel Economy. This basically does all the calculations for you. You just put the miles per gallon, the miles, and the pence per litre, and it tells you how much it will have cost you for that entire journey. So now you know how, let's have a look at the figures for 40, 50, and 60 miles per gallon. Uh, we'll start off with the most efficient first. And remember, this is over the whole life of the 100,000 miles, not just on a nice motorway run where it's nice and efficient. Uh, 60 miles per gallon, 9,678 pounds in fuel. 50 is 11,614, and if you uh, average 40 miles per gallon, 14,500 pounds. Crikey, I mean, if I compared my Mini Cooper S, that would probably at the 40 miles per gallon average. In fact, in reality, it's probably less than that because most of its driving is just done for fun, but yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot on fuel alone. Remember, this is just fuel, not maintenance, not tax, just fuel alone. Now, of course, we need to compare both of them together. ICE versus EV. So I'm gonna put the EV real world figure up because that's achievable by anyone that can charge at home if they actually just look around at the best tariff and the public charging figure. So if you can't charge at home, that's what at the moment at least you will end up paying under the worst case scenario. So here they are. And as you can see there, the real world of two and a half thousand pounds versus even the most efficient petrol diesel car is well nearly nearly well I'll say seven thousand pounds cheaper so over a hundred thousand miles you're saving seven thousand pounds 
If we then go to the other end of the scale, 40 miles per gallon, 14 and a half grand versus two and a half, so that is a saving of 12,000 pounds. 12 grand! Obviously, if you get 20 miles per gallon or something ridiculous like that, then the savings would be even higher. But this is a perfect example of why people, especially if you do a lot of miles like myself, choose an EV because the fuel savings are huge. And before anyone mentions it, depreciation is far, far, far lower on EVs right now compared to any combustion engine car other than something exotic. The car I'm sat in right now hasn't dropped in value in 18 months, even though it's that much older and I've done another probably 30 odd thousand miles on it. The same price. Some have even appreciated in value. Obviously, if you buy a high end Tesla, that will drop, but the supply is down here and demand is up here. And that's keeping use prices very high, um, which means depreciation is very, very low. And if anything, depreciation is probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, factors in how much a car costs you. If you factor in the total cost of ownership, this is a classic example of why you shouldn't just look at a list price and think, can't do that. Yes, you've got to be able to afford the monthly payment. That's the sticking point. But eventually, according to several manufacturers who currently don't produce an EV, uh, or barely an EV anyway, uh, believe that they will achieve price parity, as in electric will cost the same as petrol to produce in, t uh, in just six years, in by 2025. Now, public charging, that's a, obviously a different kettle of fish. This is, as I said many times, the worst case scenario. So it's probably nearer the 6.2 thousand rather than the 8.3 for, for everyone. Uh, and by the time we get to proper mass adoption, there will probably be significant subscriptions out there for heavy users, like there is in Holland right now with Fastned. You're still saving, even on the very worst case scenario, £1,300 compared to a very efficient petrol en or diesel engine. Obviously, compared to a 40 miles a gallon car, you're saving, well, it's nearly half the price anyway, and that's using the currently relatively expensive charging network. Everybody's different, of course, and everybody's charging profile will be different. I can't give every example in this video because it would just go on forever. Uh, so there's clearly a benefit there to people who can charge at home as opposed to people who well, can't charge at home, who don't have a drive. If you can't charge at home, it's a bit of a contentious issue in the comment section, I find. I always get the comments from people saying, well, it's all right for you boys that can charge at home. You, you rich people who have a driveway. What about us poor people in flats and apartments and terraced houses? I've owned houses with, with no drive before. I mean, hell, I live in Yorkshire. <laughs> I'm hardly at the high end of the property ladder. The way I look at it, if you have two identical houses, one with a drive and one without, the house without a drive will be thousands of pounds cheaper, possibly tens of thousands of pounds cheaper, depending on where in the UK it is, than the one with a drive. So you've saved a fortune on your house, but you have to pay more for charging your car. Or you buy a house with a drive and you spend thousands more on the house, but you can charge for cheaper. There's pros and cons to everything. It's taken me or us, should I say, years and years of house ownership before we got to a stage that we're, at, that we're at. Now, it's not a right to have a driveway to be able to charge at home any more than it's a right to have a swimming pool in your garden. I don't look at people with swimming pools and go, well, look at them, the lucky gits. Why can't I have a swimming pool? I demand a swimming pool, damn it. If you want to drive, move to one with a drive. I don't know what more to tell you. If we couldn't afford a house that came with a driveway, then I guess we'll just have to wait, save up for longer. I would love a swimming pool, as I said, but I can't afford one. It doesn't mean I have a go at people who have a swimming pool. My house is probably worth half of a small flat in London, but you don't see me complaining. I live in one of the poorest areas of the country, so I don't think I can be accused of being privileged. We've worked for, for decades to get where we are, and I'm not going to apologise for that. So if you have a problem with people who have driveways and sees them as this, well, well it's all right for you lot, I don't have what you have, therefore no one can. That, that does my ending, does that. If you want something, go and get it. Save up. It might take you years, it's taken me years, it's just how it is. I don't know why I've gone off on this little rant on this one. This is this is gone off topic a little bit here, so let's get back on topic. This is where people tend to say, oh, hang on a minute, um, they're just going to tax electricity, you know, electric cars or fuel on electric because obviously the tax will drop on petrol. If people suddenly jump to an EV world, then where is the government going to get its money from? Now, I understand this and it kind of does make sense, but they are not going to put tax on electricity. 
certainly not home electricity, because that would be political suicide. It would push people, especially those that you know are on a low income that don't have an EV as well, it would push them into fuel poverty, potentially, because your house powers everything, not just your car. So that, that will never happen. They will never put tax on electricity for just to get at those that happen to charge at home. I personally envisage a future, and I think we're a couple of decades or you know, probably more away from this sort of thing, where we'll end up paying pence per mile or something like that. You know, you'll pay to use the road network rather than tax on fuel. Even if somehow they could figure out a way of the electric car charger of telling the government how much you've used in electricity just to charge your car, people will just use a three-pin plug. And there's no way of knowing where that electricity is going. So there, have to, there will be a different way of charging, of, of getting tax from people. That much is certain. But what makes me laugh are those that say, people who buy electric cars are just effectively doing tax avoidance. They're just avoiding paying tax because they're not paying tax on fuel. <laughs> I've never heard some bollocks in my life. That's like saying, well, uh, people who eat fruit, which is taxed less than biscuits, are just avoiding tax. They're not eating healthily at all. They're just tax avoiders. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By buying an EV, you're just avoiding tax. <laughs> By having a pension, you're avoiding tax. It's all the same. But no, uh, you know what? I'm going to go on a mini rant again, and I'm not going to do it. Right, well, that's it, obviously. There are many, many different variables, many different usage patterns out there, which means that this will be, it's an average. Like I said, this is an average, and I would like to think a fairly accurate one. As I said, this is just fuel only, not all the other things that encompass EV ownership and petrol car ownership. At the moment, EVs are more expensive to buy. It's, it's just a fact. If you had a, an e-Golf versus a, a normal equivalently spec Golf, the electric version would be more expensive. Uh, again, price parity will be achieved in certainly within the decade, so it, it, it is evening out, it is getting better, uh, but this is just one example of why EVs can actually be cheaper for you to own. If you do enough miles, or the more miles you do in an EV, the cheaper it gets when compared to a petrol or diesel car, because as I said, the fuel is so cheap, it can, it can offset a huge amount of the, price, the extra price for the EV, to the point where it eventually will do that and the electric car will get cheaper. Factor in almost non-existent depreciation for the, the lower end of the EV budget anyway, and it genuinely is a cheaper car to own. So that's it. Now, again, if you uh, are wondering, or you just can't be bothered, on what the best tariff is for an EV driver, again, I will put the link in the description below to a video which shows you who, at least a few months ago anyway, was the cheapest electricity tariff for someone who drives an EV and obviously has higher electricity usage than, than average. Please do subscribe, it does help and make a difference, and click the bell icon, because then you get a notification of when I put a video up. Right, thank you for watching as usual guys, and I'll see you soon.